uh, Andrew is um, a blogger, super uh, big expert um, on, in growth from Silicon Valley. Welcome. And I've met Andrew. Welcome. Hi, everyone. And I've met Andrew a few years ago, um, back when um, I think I started at Facebook, and we had a really interesting chat about Facebook versus Twitter and a lot of other stuff since then. Facebook anyway. was the right, right choice. <laughs> Wow. Okay, so um, it's really exciting to have you here. And then to, uh, to have a chat with you, uh, we have a, a classmate of mine from Stanford, Tim Chang, who's a managing partner at Mayfield Fund and also a um, very prominent speaker and expert in uh, everything related to growth. In particular, I think I've heard you speak a lot about games and quantified self and a lot of other stuff. Anyways, uh, you two are uh, awesome people, great friends, and I'm really excited to hear uh, your conversation. Great. Thanks for having us. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Tim Chang, a managing director at Mayfield Fund, early stage venture capital firm uh, here in the Valley. Um, we were early investors in Lyft back when it was called Zimride, so it's been fascinating to watch what a, what a rocket ship that has been. Um, I'm really excited to have Andrew. I've been a long time admirer. So you were one of the very early pundits on um, user acquisition, growth marketing, all those sorts of things. You had a blog, even one of the first ones in that space. That's right. Um, could you tell us a bit about your journey and how you kind of got to where you are now at Uber? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'd love to see a show of hands who's read my blog over the years. Cool. Great. A couple of you. Thank you. Thank you. And sorry I'm taking a blog vacation. It's, I'm, I'm busy <laughs> with a new job. Um, yeah, so, so as many of you guys um, uh, may have read on my blog, I've, uh, I've started at Uber in, in the last uh, month working on supply growth. So really, uh, you know, increasing number of drivers on the road, which is a really important problem. But um, yeah, the, the way that, uh, that I ended up, um, you know, here is um, originally, I actually started my career in, um, in venture capital. I worked at a firm called Moore David Al Ventures, um, you know, back in the day in, in Seattle. And I worked at a number of their portfolio companies. Um, but one of the most important, um, you know, experiences I had was to actually work in ad tech. Um, and, and the most interesting thing about ad tech is you spend, you know, all of your time thinking about, like, customer acquisition for, like, all of your, you know, tens of thousands of customers. Like, they're, you know, paying money, sort of outsourcing their growth and their acquisition to you. Um, and so you learn all these like really, really interesting things. Like for example, you know, it, when your customers are like dating sites, um, you know, they sort of know that, uh, you know, their average user will like find their, you know, their, somebody that they want to like uh, actually date within four months. So they're really incented to try to get you to like sign up for a subscription, like for like a 12 month subscription, like right away, right? And that's like very different than the guys that are doing, um, you know, games or that are doing, you know, these other things. And so what you end up learning a ton about is um, really understanding like funnel optimization yeah. and like cost per customer and LTV. And so when I finally moved to the Bay Area in 2007, um, and I was an entrepreneur in residence back at, back my, at my old firm, uh, More David Adventures. Um, you know, I was one of the few folks that had like all this, you know, sort of quantitative experience, um, you know, with, uh, with customer acquisition, but really wanted to apply it in like a consumer context. And, uh, you know, as we know back in, you know, 07, you know, the IQ around this within, you know, consumer products and mobile was just like really low. I mean, literally investors were investing based on like how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of registered users right. did you have? Um, and, and the whole industry has been like upgraded. It's been amazing to see over the last, um, you know, couple of years. And so right before uh, signing up for Uber, I was working on some of my own startups. I was advising uh, the CEO of Dropbox mm -hmm. on some of their growth uh, initiatives. And, you know, in the end I decided to, you know, work for um, you know, one of the true rocket ship companies of this generation and uh, working on, you know, so I'm, so I'm really happy to be there. Great. All right. So <clears throat> we'll start with the punchline first. If there's only one lesson you'd want everyone here to remember about growth, what would that be if there's a, a key takeaway? From yeah. That? Well, I, I think one of the most confusing things, especially if most of what you're learning about growth is, um, you know, sort of like through the blogosphere is that there's so much uh, you know, content there about growth that's so tactical, it's sort of like tips and tricks and all of these like, little things that you can do. Oh, you know, use this phrasing, like color this button, this thing. Um, and I tend to see that like, the, the, the very best um, uh, you know, minds on growth actually think of, think of growth as um, you know, that you have a model for growth and that there's a system to it and you have all these interlinking parts. So if you're gonna do a paid acquisition loop 
where you know you're able to um, you know grow your user base over time because you can buy them more efficiently than you know how you're monetizing them. You know that's like an entire like loop and system that then you have to apply all the tips and tactics to actually optimize, right? Um, and if you're going to do virality, it's not just about building something that's like really cool, but actually thinking about like you know how does one batch of users end end up inviting the next batch of users and that optimizing that entire loop. Yep. And so then what ends up happening is all the tactics and tips, of course you need to know them. That's sort of like standard, you know, that's just table stakes, it's just cookbook kind of stuff um, in terms of actually, you know, building up that loop. But you have to think about it as a system and keep track of all the key ratios right. and, and really think about, you know, have deep product thinking on how you're going to keep people, you know, going. Um, I think the reason why these case studies, these kind of one-off tips and tricks are so popular is because that is what, uh, you know, these like little bite-sized tips are what seem to propagate, you know, on Twitter, <laughs> like most effectively. It's like what we all want to retweet. Like we see a little graph with a little stat on it and it's like, oh cool, I feel like incrementally smarter by like retweeting right. this. Um, and so that's what right. like people are really into, right. you know, versus the hard work of actually fitting all of these frameworks into like situationally what's right for your product. And that's like actually the hard work that, you know, when you look at a company like Facebook or Uber that has hundreds of folks on their growth team, you know, they're doing a lot of that hard work, not the like quick tactical hits. Speaking of quick tactical hits, it's, it's like we're all looking for little silver bullets, right? On that. That's right. That's, you know, I think the affinity for, oh, give me a quick thing I can do right now to boost numbers. Um, this has led to a certain ethos around growth hacking. Um, I also feel like we're starting to see some vilification of that term, right? What's yes. your take on, on what a growth hacker is? Is that a, a real sustainable practice or is it actually a deeper role? Would you differentiate between, say, growth versus engagement hacking or yeah. retention hacking? Yeah, great, great question. So I think, you know, so first, the, the really 30 second thing about like the term growth hacker is that um, this guy, Sean Ellis, came up with it. And he's based in uh, Southern California, and he was doing this thing where he was sort of a part-time VP marketing at a bunch of Sequoia companies, like, simultaneously. So, like, you do Eventbrite, Dropbox, and, like, Zobni all at the same time. Very fancy job, fancy guy. Um, and what he found was that whenever, you know, Sequoia would say, hey, we really think you should engage with Sean Ellis, you know, he's an amazing VP marketing, like, head, head of marketing. Uh, you know, the founders, you know, who you know, some of the very best ones who come from technical backgrounds would immediately think like, oh wow, like who is this guy? Like yep. go away, that's horrible. You're gonna buy like Super Bowl ads or something, right? right? Um, but he was really like a direct response marketer yep. uh, combined with like, like a product manager, like all in one. Right. And he really cared about analytics and he really knew what he was doing. And so he eventually started to introduce himself as, um, as a growth hacker. Right as a way to, you know, sort of make that whole, you know, uh, effort like palatable, right? right? That it wasn't just like build amazing features and then, you know, your users show up that you have to actually really like work on it. Right. And so, um, so he told me this over brunch like several years ago and then, um, and then I wrote a couple blog posts about it. And I remember when I wrote the original blog post, there was actually nobody with the term growth hacker uh -huh. like on LinkedIn as their title. And now yeah. when you look on LinkedIn, there's actually like hundreds of people that have the term growth hacker <laughs> in their thing, which is a little bit, um, uh, you know, it, it, like it's become kind of a negative signal yep. because it's sort of the next generation of the sort of like consultant, you know, kind of keyword and keywords and titles. Um, you know, versus when you look at like how this stuff is really being done in, you know, the very best, you know, growth teams, it really is a team effort. Like mm -hmm. you have PMs and designers and engineers who, um, you know, sure, like they're, what they ship and the, what the output of the team is are really like, you know, growth KPIs, but the tools that they use to actually generate those KPIs is software. It's actually code, you know, that ends up doing it. And so, you know, because of that, it's a very fundamental shift, I think, you know, versus, um, you know, what, what would be sort of traditionally marketing activities. Right. Um, and I think that's what's new, and that's what, you know, I really think of as, as growth is, it's fundamentally, it's a product thing. Is it also tied to sort of the KPIs we measure? Because sometimes if growth hacking is just measured by number of new installs or downloads, that yeah, might right. incentivize people to just game that system, which could be about, you know, kind of viral tactics and tuning and that kind of stuff, which leads to that whole shark fin effect. Yeah, the shark fin, yeah. We've had a couple of those now over the years. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's one of the interesting things is that um, obviously when you're a startup, uh, so much of what you think of as growth is just new, new user acquisition, right? Because, you know, you don't really think about churn, you don't really think about engagement, you just need people to, like, show up. Right. But as you get bigger, you know, and you, as you have a big base, 
um, you know, churn becomes one of the most defining aspects of whether or not your, your business is actually sustainable or not. So I think one of the really interesting things is, yeah, absolutely, do not conflate growth and acquisition. Like growth right. is sort of, you know, for like what I think about it is, um, you know, the way that I often describe it is that metrics ought to be a reflection of the strategy that you've like decided, right? And, it, and, you, and you pick the metrics to be situational to your business so that they're able to validate that your strategy is actually working. Yep. Versus if you go and you take, you're like, oh, Facebook uses DAUs, we should use DAUs. Well, if you're like an e-commerce site that's not really a DAUs focused right. you know, product, like that, that doesn't make you know, very much sense at all. Yep. So I think having a broader sense of like, you know, what, what growth really means, I yep. think is, is super important. What I'm hearing you say too is it's, it's really a systems level problem. You're thinking of the whole system, how product and marketing and engagement, all that kind of fits together, not just little isolated pieces that you kind of gamify or, or that's optimize. Right. That's right. And, you know, to, to take an analogy, like if you take something like design, right, there are designers who like think about the entire product and how, you know, how you interact with it, how it looks, you know, the experience like before you even encounter the product and what happens afterwards and really like a systems level thinking about the design. And then there are people who are like, you know, yeah, they're like using, you know, Photoshop to like pump out logos, right? right. And like that term is like designer spans that entire, you know, spectrum. And I think in the same way, growth really spans that entire spectrum as well. There are certainly hacks out there, and there are certainly people who are like, you know, professionals that are really like pushing the industry forward. So, um, you know, on that spectrum of sort of what makes a good product, I've heard the most extreme product folks say the best product doesn't need marketing. It'll market itself. What's your take on that? Have you, have you seen sort of is sometimes too much reliance on marketing actually just trying to put lipstick on a pig? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. So going back to this whole shark fin thing, you know, one of the most interesting um, things that if you guys were in the industry during the Facebook platform, yep. um, when there was so much insane, you know, acquisition to be had, you know, for the first time ever, you could literally go from zero to like 10 million DAUs in like the span of a month, right? Like Zynga did that with, with uh, you know, the release of Farmville. Um, and, and what ended up happening is that, uh, you know, all of that optimization did not actually, you know, keep these things going over a long time. And right. actually, what you find is that some of the very best growth people in the world um, you know, like Ed Baker or Josh Elman and some of these guys, you know, they have been more effective helping products that are already like working mm. scale and like run up the score versus, um, you know, sort of like building products from scratch because right. that's, that's really hard. So, you know, I think on the product market fit thing, you know, I think that's sort of the pattern that we've seen is that, um, you know, that there's these startups that get created you know, that you really, you build from the heart, right? These products that you build from the heart, you listen to every, you know, every one of your customers, you're hyper attentive, you get all the details right, and that kind of gives you some great momentum. But then you get to a point where, okay, great, now you have to scale that. Um, and you have to start going into countries where maybe like you have no idea like what the usage is gonna be like. Um, you know, you, you, then you start switching to more quantitative mindset. Um, and you start to really optimize and scale what that looks like. And I think that that sort of phase transition is a really interesting and tough one, um, you know, for entrepreneurs to, to, to handle, yep. um, you know, which, which, of course, you know, you've seen many times. Totally. Um, so to finish up, let's talk about the notion of growth and new platforms. The big conundrum right now everyone complains about is, man, the app stores are crowded. I don't know how to, you know, make my way in mobile. Um, it's hard to get uh, attention. It's hard to stand out. It's getting expensive. Um, you know, how valid is that? And then how important are always keeping an eye out on new platforms? For example, Instagram with its newly open ad platform or other new platforms like, say, messaging. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I, th I think especially in mobile, you know, we're sort of in um, kind of dark ages for consumer <laughs> mobile right now. There was like so much uh, excitement, especially I think like three or four years ago, and there was Instagram and Snap, you know, and, and, and there was a lot of investor interest. And I think now what we're seeing is that uh, the bar to actually um, be successful on mobile is, is super, super high in a way that re really didn't exist you know, for web apps. Okay, so what's the reason for that? And the reason is because when you look at web apps, you have so many channels and so many things have been built over the years. You can do SCM, you can do SEO, you can do email virality, you can do, there's so many channels of paid marketing, there's display, there's retargeting, there's all these different things. And then as soon as you move to mobile apps, you're like, okay, by the way, your iteration cycle, you, can't, you can no longer ship things same day, right? You have to actually wait and get things reviewed. Um, and then like the number of like paid advertising channels and like SEO and SEM, all these equivalents, uh, you know, don't really exist. 
And by the way, we're also gonna do this leaderboard thing where like basically as you win, you know, the, the, bigger, uh, the biggest guys yep. get even bigger, right. right? And sort of winners takes all, right? And so I think that environment has created one that's really unfavorable to new apps and new startups. And it's, and it's a really scary thing. And I don't know that we're in, at a point right now where, you know, there's an obvious avenue for like how to launch a new, you know, mobile app and, and go for it. So, you know, as you mentioned, I think that um, it's certainly true, like messaging is a really interesting you know, um, area because it's sort of consensus belief at this point that these messaging apps are going to create the next platform beyond app stores. And so we'll, I, think, I think that's certainly really interesting. And I think we're seeing that like, um, I sort of have this theory that messaging is sort of where social was, uh, you know, during, during like 2007, 2008, where um, on one hand you had things that were um, actually literally social networks, uh, you know, like Facebook, and you know, high five and friends, you know, all the stuff that used to exist back, back then. But the other experiment that was actually even more powerful was actually adding social to like other categories of products. So you were like social reviews, boom, that's Yelp, right? Social videos, boom, that's you know, YouTube, right? And adding social to a bunch of things. Now it turns out you can't add social to everything. Right. Uh, that doesn't always work. Like it turns out, you know, social plus personal finance doesn't really make sense, or social <laughs> plus, you know, I have a disease that I need to look up doesn't make sense. <laughs> Right, um, you know, and I think in the same way with messaging is that we'll find that messaging plus dating actually turns out that's like really interesting, or messaging plus you know maybe some of this on-demand stuff yep. like will be interesting, um, and so people will continue to explore messaging, and I think we'll see that there's going to be, you know, I think I, I think I'm certainly very hopeful that messaging will will create the next generation platform. Um, you know, for mobile app distribution. Especially as they open up APIs, right? And we've already seen that in China. WeChat out there is Facebook, and that's how the majority of apps get distributed, games, et cetera. That's right. Um, uh, the way I've been sort of paraphrasing it is, Andreessen Horowitz likes to talk about software eating the world, and I kind of see actually messaging eating software and apps, right? That's right. So you could pretty much see broad horizontal messaging networks adding in widgets and apps into their interface. They're replicating the OS. On the other hand, every good app maker should probably be baking messaging layers into their apps if they haven't already and That's introducing right. additional services that That's way. That's right. Yeah. yeah, I think we've, we've really figured out that messaging and communication is really the killer app for your phone. Yep. And so then working backwards to, um, you know, when you have a new idea or new product offering, how does it relate to messaging? I yep. think is a very important question if you, you know, are thinking ahead and want, want to be hitting scale like two or three years from now is yep. sort of how to be clever about that. That's right. Um, last question is, who are the influencers you follow? Any books, newsletters, blogs you'd recommend folks to check out? <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so, so I think uh, one book I definitely want to call out that I, that I love, and it's a really old book, it's actually 100 years old, which is great, uh, is, a, is a book called uh, My Life in Advertising. Hmm. And, um, and it's about uh, the guy who, um, he actually like invented coupons. Uh, he invented sort of like uh, spectacle marketing, like sort of event marketing, like having, you know, building the biggest like uh, birthday cake, oh, you know, yeah. ever in a city and then getting all these people to come and like look at it. Yep. Um, and so I think what's really interesting about this guy, uh, I forget the author's name, but it, the book is called My Life in Advertising. Um, it, it's really about the idea of how he was able to recognize and develop brand new channels and brand new um, you know, growth ideas uh, for, for his clients and, um, and really ride that, you know, for, for a while. And so he was really, really innovative. And so I think, you know, I think the lesson that I love to draw from that is instead of just thinking about like, okay, everybody's doing, you know, email marketing, we should do that too. Or everybody's doing, um, you know, this clever thing in the app store, we should do that too. That there's a huge advantage in being like the first to a marketing channel yep. um, and, and, and sort of challenging yourself to actually develop that. So I think, I think it's, a, it's a really interesting you know, take there. And then I think for, in terms of like you know, you know, digital reading and everything, I mean, I, I'm sure I read exactly the same things that everybody else reads. Um, but uh, you know, Ben Thompson writes a great newsletter. He's based in Taiwan called Stratechery. Um, and he writes it every day. I, he's like a content machine and he's doing great. Um, and, and Ben Evans, of course. Um, I also really like a book um, called Designing Interactions, um, which was published by uh, some folks over at IDEO. And it's basically a bunch of case studies um, going back historically all, into, you know, all the way back to the you know, uh, 1970s about different technology products and sort of trying to get to product market fit. Yep. Um, you know, why did the first PDA fail? And sort of you know, going through all the iterations of what they need to do to actually solve that. So I love that book as well. Thank you, Andrew. 
Let's give a warm round of applause for Andrew. Thank you.